coming up on Global Business, following high-level meetings in Beijing. French President Emmanuel Macron headed to South China's Guangzhou today to meet with academic leaders and students. The world's top brands are ready to unlock more opportunities in the world's second largest consumer market. We'll preview the upcoming third China International Consumer Products Expo in Hainan. And following the surprise oil cuts from OPEC Plus earlier in the week, We'll explore what the move might mean for the role of the U.S. dollar in the global economy. And welcome everyone to Global Business here on CGTN. I'm Michael Wong in Beijing. It's the final day of French President Emmanuel Macron's three-day state visit here to China. Now, following high-level meetings in Beijing, President Macron today met with academic leaders and students in South China's Guangzhou. He paid a visit to Sun Yat-sen University, one of China's top academic institutes, which has substantial ties with French institutions. Our Omar Khan has more. It's a significant moment for both sides, as Emmanuel Macron's visit to Guangdong province is the first ever by a sitting French president. His tour of Sun Yat-sen University in Guangzhou is no anomaly as the institute began collaborating with the University of Lyon III some 23 years ago. And since 2018, the university has collaborated with France on at least eight major research projects, ranging in the fields of healthcare, biotechnology, and energy. After three years of the pandemic, I'm happy to be back in China. And I had the opportunity to speak and hold a discussion with the Chinese president yesterday in Beijing. And I will see him soon later today. But I'm also happy to restart dialogue and conversation on what our relations, China and France, can do for ourselves, people and the entire world. French multinational EDF Group, whose executives are accompanying Macron to China, participated in the establishment of the Sino-French Institute of Nuclear Engineering and Technology at Sun Yat-sen University. It's a major undertaking bringing both sides closer together in both the fields of higher education and energy sectors while providing a platform for academic and student exchanges. We, China and France, have a lot to do together. A lot to do in terms of overcoming challenges faced by multiple generations and recognizing the ecological transition and solving challenges of climate change and ensuring the protection of biodiversity. Speaking and engaging with students, Macron's visit coincides with the 35th anniversary of the establishment of sister city ties between Guangzhou and Lyon two cities known for their academic prowess, culinary history, and cultures. Aside from cultural and academic exchanges, President Macron's visit to China is seemingly paying off when it comes to business and investment. Aviation giant Airbus yesterday announced it would open a second factory here in China, essentially doubling its output in the country. And for two countries that saw bilateral trade exceed 100 billion euros last year, it's small developments like this that could help resolve issues between China and the European Union. Omar Khan, CGTN, Guangzhou. And like our Omar Khan was just mentioning, Mr. Macron is the first sitting French president to visit Guangzhou, an export powerhouse that holds a unique position in China-France economic ties. Now, France was China's third largest trading partner in the European Union last year. Guangdong province accounts for about a fifth of China's total trade with France. A range of major French companies have long invested in Guangdong province. For example, European aviation giant Airbus has inaugurated the company's second innovation center in Shenzhen. The company has worked with China Mobile, Huawei and Tencent to tap into local expertise, technology and the talent pool. French multinational EDF Group established a satellite campus in the city of Zhuhai in Guangdong province as well. EDF has been in Guangdong for some three decades, working on a variety of projects in Guangdong, including the Daya Bay nuclear power plant project. That would be the largest cooperation between France and China in the field of energy. So let's take a closer look at how the French public have reacted to President Macron's visit to Guangdong province and cross tour correspondent Ross Cullen over in Paris. Ross, thank you for joining us. So first of all, how have the French people reacted to President Macron's recent trip to Guangzhou and Guangdong? 
Yeah, that was the uh, the final stop for Emmanuel Macron uh, today on uh, the end of his three-day visit uh, trip to uh, Guangzhou to uh, meet uh, students uh, for a rapturous reception. That's very different from the kind of reception he would receive from uh, French students if he were to attend a university at the moment. He doesn't have very high popularity ratings here at home, but he did have pretty high popularity ratings going by the reaction of students uh, at that university on Friday morning local time. And then he went for tea uh, with Xi Jinping, much more relaxed for the two leaders. The ties were off. Uh, it was just them and their interpreters having a refreshing cup of tea and then the final event for Emmanuel Macron meeting Chinese investors before he flies home due back here to France on Saturday. Mm. And Ross, what are the outcomes of President Macron's state visit to China? Well, you just mentioned uh, just ahead of the, the report, EDF, that was one of the big French companies that was traveling with the president. Such a big business delegation going along with Emmanuel Macron. One of those companies was Airbus, the pan-European plane maker, along with uh, Boeing, one of the world's two biggest aircraft manufacturers. Airbus is headquartered here in France in the southern city of Toulouse. They announced they're going to be doubling the capacity of the aircraft they produce in China, also building a second uh, factory. So in terms of the business deals and the economic side, the commercial uh, contracts, there was uh, success. On the Ukraine crisis, as China calls it, uh, the special military operation, as Russia calls it, or the war, as Ukraine, the EU and France describe it, uh, there was the, uh, the attempt by Emmanuel Macron to try to urge Xi Jinping Jinping to use his influence that he has uh, with Russia, that special relationship between Moscow and Beijing, to try to bring uh, pressure on uh, Vladimir Putin to withdraw his troops from inside uh, Ukraine. There was the uh, the agreement from uh, Xi Jinping, the Chinese leader, that there should be uh, working towards a political so solution, a political negotiation, and overall uh, world peace. The attempts also by the European leaders, Ursula von der Leyen and Emmanuel Macron, to try to uh, ensure that Xi Jinping agreed uh, to a telephone call at the very least with Volodymyr Zelensky and Xi Jinping did say that he would be able to take that call when time and conditions were right. All right, many thanks for that report. Our Ross Cullen for us in Paris. Thank you. Well, partnerships between Chinese and European companies in the pharmaceutical sector have a long history. One European company heavily involved in the Chinese market is Serfier, the second largest French pharmaceutical group. CGTN's Biran spoke to the company's China general manager, Manuel Ruiz, about its plans to deepen its involvement through high-quality development and innovation. Take a look. China is now the world's second largest pharma market with huge potential to tap into. What's the current status of China-French collaboration in this field? Servier was one of the first pharma companies to be established uh, in China. This is more than 40 years presence in China with uh, manufacturing, R&D capacity, and many, uh, many medical exchanges uh, between Chinese and French doctors. Uh, for example, we implemented this uh, Sino-French Medical Day, uh, and with uh, last year, a strong focus in oncology, with the most renowned experts uh, on this field from China and from France, sharing uh, good experiences in terms of uh, prevention, awareness, and treatment for the, the, the patients. And we have this uh, uh, development uh, in low-grade glioma. Uh, this is, uh, again, a, a global development uh, with exchanges between uh, clinical uh, centers in China and clinical centers in Europe, in the U.S. So, yes, many opportunities to have a strong collaboration uh, between China and France. Savvy has witnessed the development of Chinese market in the past 40 years. So what does Chinese style modernity mean to the global market? For China is the high quality development. Uh, high quality development with uh, continuous innovation. Uh, and in terms of pharma market, it means a change from a market dominated by generics to a market more driven by innovation. Uh, and I think China made a lot of efforts in the past years, uh, joining and implementing the International Council for Harmonization, meaning um, easing the review process of a drug. All these changes uh, clearly favor uh, the, the development of foreign companies 
uh, aiming to improve the, the access of innovation for Chinese patients and for French patients. China is, is, is a key market for, uh, for Servier uh, with a, a huge potential and again we have been implemented here for more than 40 years with manufacturing, uh, commercialization and R&D activities, uh, meaning that uh, we are able to run a clinical trial in China and with Chinese patients. We want to reinforce our presence in, in China for the, the coming years. Uh, this is key and this is not only a matter of sales but also a matter of innovation uh, for worldwide uh, operation of, uh, of Servier. China is the first market for Servier out of its French headquarters to have the ability of early phase R&D and capabilities to transform it into scale. In the future, will China and French deepen collaboration in such fields? My objective and our objective in Servier is to promote China. Uh, to be part and to be a leader in the global research and development of new drugs. And we know that the innovation in China is going very fast, so we want to be part of this innovation. To uh, reinforce the medical exchanges, uh, mm -hmm. to better understand uh, the situation of the market in Europe, in China, to better understand the regulation process between these two countries. And the more we collaborate, the more we'll know how we can work together, the more we'll be able to develop this, uh, this global approach, uh, including uh, China. And up next here on Global Business. The world's top brands are ready to unlock more opportunities in the world's second largest consumer market. We'll preview the upcoming third China International Consumer Products Expo in Hainan. Exploring the latest trends in the consumer sector the brands most preferred by customers, and the stories behind the names. Building a closer connection between a supersized consumer market and global brands. All eyes are on the third China International Consumer Products Expo in Haikou, as leading brands gather to share insights and discover new opportunities from a China opening wider to the world. Join our special coverage of the event as we bring you an in-depth look at cutting-edge consumer trends that will shape a better life for the future. Only on CGT. Well, according to data from travel agency Ctrip.com, travel demand here in China is not only recovering steadily, but also fast approaching pre-pandemic levels. Bookings for the upcoming five-day Labor Day holiday are comparable to 2019. Domestic travel demand since the beginning of this year has been seven times higher than a year ago, while bookings for overseas trips have risen over 18-fold. In China's consumption recovery will benefit retail property owners and operators with stronger retail sales supporting occupancies and rentals, says a new report from Fitch Ratings. The Global Credit Ratings Agency said Chinese consumers have resumed brick-and-mortar shopping. That's after the country eased COVID-19 controls, resulting in higher rental incomes for retail property owners and operators. Dalian Wanda Commercial Management Group, that's China's largest mall owner and operator, is set to benefit the most, said Fitch, adding that sales of retail properties with residential projects will also accelerate, further improving cash flows for developers. Well, as one of the four national-level exhibitions in China, the third China International Consumer Products Expo, also known as the Hainan Expo, will be held next week in Hainan Province. Well, this year's expo is also the first important international exhibition held offline here in China since the easing of COVID-19 restrictions. Shi Xiaopeng gives us a sneak peek of the preparations on the ground. I'm now at the Hainan International Convention and Exhibition Center. We can say that the preparations here are almost complete. The third China International Consumer Product Exhibit will be held here from April the 10th to the 15th. As a major international exhibition, the Expo will facilitate import of consumer goods and expand the supply of high-quality products. This year, the Expo is spread over an area of 120,000 square meters, with 80,000 square meters reserved for the international exhibitors. Several new products are set to make their debut at the Expo, with an eye on the vast consumer market in China. At present, the third Hainan Expo has basically completed the booth setup and entered the two-day exhibition preparation stage from today.
Before that, more than 4,000 exhibits were transported to the 1,000 square meter exhibition warehouse. Exhibits such as jewelry, perfume, cosmetics, clothing, cultural relics and furniture from various countries and regions such as Italy, France, Japan, Thailand and Hong Kong will make their way to the respective stalls in the next few days. More than 3,100 well-known brands from more than 60 countries and regions have confirmed their participation in the expo. Italy is the guest of honor country this year. Leaders of seven countries and heads of international organizations, as well as trade delegations from 30 provinces, will be present in Hainan for the expo. Some 50,000 buyers and professional visitors are also expected to be at the event. During the expo, Multiple events will be held with various themes, such as duty-free shopping, coffee industry, and green consumption. Up to now, nearly 30 global CEOs of Fortune Global 500 and industry-leading enterprises have confirmed their participation in the expo, such as Tumi, Cody, Kering, and Maserati. As a supporting forum for the third Hainan Expo, the Global Consumption Forum has already identified more than 40 thematic forums, focused on such hot topics as new consumption models and business models, high-end shopping and medical consumption reflux in Hainan Free Trade Port, and green and sustainable development. These forums will discuss changes in global emerging consumption trends. At the same time, experts and scholars and professional consultancies like PwC, DTT, KPMG, EY, Boston Consulting Group, Accenture, Nielsen will be invited to release a series of flagship reports, white papers at the Global Consumption Forum. During the expo, 550 buses will be deployed to ferry people to and from the expo. The buses will be operated on 34 routes, including 12 special public bus routes, two free shuttle bus routes, and two duty free shopping bus routes. Shao Peng, Sansha Satellite TV in Haikou, Hainan Province, for CGTN. And still to come here on Global Business. Following the surprise oil cuts from OPEC Plus earlier in the week, we'll explore what that move might mean for the role of the U.S. dollar in the global economy. Three hundred sixty degree profiles of industry movers and shakers, tech mavericks, and policymakers. We drill down on their success. We ask how they set strategy and how they navigate in an increasingly competitive market. Real talk, real business. Join the conversation. Biz talk. Only on CGTN. To the U.S. labor markets, where the U.S. unemployment rate edged down to 3.5 percent in March as the country added more than expected 236,000 jobs. However, job growth slowed in March when compared with earlier months. And moving on to the energy markets, where global oil prices rose by over 6 percent at the beginning of the week. That's, of course, following a new output cut announced by major producers. Since then, prices have stabilized at higher levels for most part of the week. Brent crude futures are trading at around 85 U.S. dollars per barrel, while U.S. oil is slightly over 80 dollars per barrel. That's both up, again, more than 6 percent compared to last week. Besides the OPEC plus output cut announced over the weekend, oil prices also got a boost from hedge fund investors and improving demand in the past few days. So earlier this week, top OPEC producers Saudi Arabia and other OPEC plus oil producers unexpectedly announced further oil output cuts of around 1.16 million barrels per day. Those voluntary cuts will start from May and last until the end of the year. Our Jim Stenman explains. A move that took many by surprise. I don't think most market players really had this on their radar. The decision by OPEC Plus to make production cuts of 1.16 million barrels per day as the world is dealing with inflation and a banking crisis. The fundamentals don't seem to show a need for a cut. 
The cuts are happening at a time when Russia has promised to make its own cuts, where there's been disruption to Iraqi oil exports into Turkey, and as China's post-COVID recovery continues, all contributing to strong oil demand. So I put all this together, it's, it's, it's not obvious to me that the market was screaming out for a cut or that there was anything really urgent for, for a cut of this size. It was described by a Saudi energy official as a precautionary measure, it was described as you know, aimed at supporting the stability of the oil market. And you know, I think OPEC Plus has made it a point um, since its establishment um, of being proactive. And so I think it has to be seen in that context. But the move risks affecting measures to curb inflation and, according to Reuters calculations, brings the total volume of cuts by OPEC Plus, which includes Saudi Arabia and Russia, to 3.66 million barrels per day, equal to 3.7 percent of global demand. These are described as voluntary cuts, so it's not within the kind of the general framework. And each member has come out and said you know, what part of this million barrels a day that, that they'll, they'll pick up. Um, that you know, seems to be roughly in line with their, in proportion to their production. But while Saudi Arabia is seen as acting in its own interest, the White House, having missed the opportunity to refill its strategic petroleum reserves, sees these cuts as unwise, arguing that lower oil prices support economic growth at a time of global uncertainty. I think generally Saudi Arabia has been more assertive in its decision making on many issues, uh, uh, you know, in the last couple of years. And for OPEC Plus leader Saudi Arabia, these cuts come at a time when the kingdom's pivot east appears to be in full swing. Especially to China, where its main customers are. So that's what it comes down to, you know, Saudi Arabia doing um, what's best for Saudi Arabia and what's best for the oil market with its partners in OPEC Plus. I think this is really the bottom line. And that is very much a trend that's only likely to accelerate in the future. Jim Stenman, CDTN, Dubai. And in news, Justin, Chinese President Xi Jinping and his French counterpart Emmanuel Macron have signed a joint statement on Friday. The statement says both sides seek to deepen cooperation. Uh, excuse me, let me read that one more time. In news, Justin, Chinese President Xi Jinping and his French counterpart Emmanuel Macron have signed a joint statement on Friday. The statement seeks to deepen important relations between both China and France and China and the broader European Union. All right, well, let's get back to the oil markets. Washington has said that it was, quote, not advisable in response to the latest oil production cuts by OPEC+. Plus. Some analysts are wondering if the move was politically or economically motivated or perhaps both. And do the latest cuts reflect a broader trend of the U.S. dollar's role in the global economy? So for more on that, let's bring in Chu Qiang, research fellow at the Beijing Foreign Studies University. Chu Qiang, welcome to the program. So in our previous report, we heard from the Dubai Bureau Chief of Global Energy News and Data Provider saying that uh, Saudi Arabia might just be doing what's best for itself, the oil markets and its partners in OPEC+. Plus. Uh, could this move be a signal to Washington that OPEC Plus wants more say in price determination despite pressure from the United States? and the petrodollar system. Of course, uh, for the OPEC, the most important uh, benefit is the oil price and the sales volume, not the petrodollar. But for the U.S., uh, their ultimate uh, goal and interest is the petrodollar. So if you uh, stand in the shoes, of uh, walk in the shoes of OPEC countries, you'll find out the oil are re non-renewable energies. So it, at the current, you know, the sentiment of the economy, basically you have two choices. One is keep the low price and then sell it in a large amount and, you know, tough through all these losses by yourself. Or you can keep it underground and wait it until the expectation goes back, wait it until the price goes higher, and then resell it at a better price. If I'm an OPEC country, I would have no hesitation to choose a second way. So I think they're just doing it for their own people's benefit and doing for their own country's, uh, you know, priority. Mm. Of course, Yuchen, we know that oil is mostly traded and priced in U.S. dollars. But earlier this year, Saudi Arabia said it was open to settling oil trade in other currencies besides the U.S. dollar. And Washington debated something called a NOPEC bill or the No Oil Producing and Exporting Cartels bill that would open Saudi Arabia to lawsuits. Uh, is there a possibility that we may see shifts and moves away from the petrodollar system? 
Oh, yes, indeed. We can see the possibilities coming. For example, in the technology and the production side, uh, we're witnessing that uh, the energy you know, structure has been very much diversified in the current uh, 10 years. Uh, like in the 1950s and 60s, uh, you, it's impossible to talk about a world without using the petroleum. But right now, we've been seeing nuclear power, electricity, green energies are happening everywhere. So basically, energy mix has already been shifting to a new goal. And also, secondly, is about the petrol dollar. The reason why we have the petrol dollar system in the first place is on one hand, America would like to uh, exert the power of the U.S. dollars through you know, the uh, uh, the petroleum, because if you don't use the U.S. dollar, fine, but still you can well use the uh, the oil. That's the reason why they want to use the petro uh, the, they want to use the oil as one of the tool. And also for the OPEC country before, they would like also to hitchhike on the U.S. dollar tool to make sure their income through the oil can be stable. But right now, most of the condition has already been shifted because right now America has already become a large oil producer itself. So its benefit has been different from before with OPEC countries. And also America's grip on the dollar power is already been weaker currently. And therefore, we're going to see major changes coming in the next five years or 10 years. Right. So looking at the broader picture in the U.S. dollar, Chichen, recently we've heard about Brazil and Argentina, for example, talking about that common currency for South America's two largest economies and bypassing the USD. We heard about Southeast Asia, for example, talking about de-dollarization efforts. India and the United Arab Emirates are in talks to perhaps use the Indian rupee instead of the dollar to trade non-oil commodities. Uh, given the heightened geopolitical tensions that we see today, how do you see the role of the U.S. dollar evolving? Well, I think U.S. dollar's role is getting weaker for sure. Well, we cannot deny that U.S. dollar used to play a positive role in the globalization and trade because with U.S. dollar, you know, the third party countries or trading partners can trade with each other with trustworthy currency that makes sure international trade can be stable and fluent. But that will take a toll on you because this service is not free. When globalization is going on very good, prosperously, and then you will see the positive effect. But when you're facing the global recession or deglobalization, and the U.S., remember that, U.S. monetary authority will always put their national interest in the first place and then to make the policies according to that. For example, right now for U.S., the first priority is control the inflation, which means they need a stronger dollar, one. And secondly, they would like to have a weaker oil because this combination will make sure that inflation will go down quickly. But when OPEC decided to reduce the production and uh, oil prices immediately rise up like 5%. You've seen in the past, like one year time, U.S. has used all kinds of tools to make sure that inflation dropped only by two or 3%, uh, you know, uh, months on months. But immediately you see 5% of the oil price up. That can be translated into like how much? Two or 3% of the rise in the, uh, uh, the price generally. So that probably debuffed U.S. effort. That's what U.S. do not want to see. So in the future, I think it's an era for everybody for their own time. OPEC countries, for sure, will fight for their own national or regional interest. But the USA, in order to fight against that, will also have another strategy. I think this split will weaken the U.S. dollar. Okay, we're going to leave it there. Many thanks for your thoughts on that. Chu Chiang, Research Fellow at the Beijing Foreign Studies University. Thank you, as always. And on that note, we're going to wrap up this edition of Global Business here on CGTN. I'm Michael Wong here in Beijing. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next time.